So patterns are everywhere in the world, and we think in patterns, and we actually understand the world when we see the patterns around us. And I want to share with you um, a word that you're all familiar with, but may have not seen it in the way that we're going to talk about. So I do a lot of writing, and I use a software called Word. And in Word, it actually has templates for types of different writing projects I might want to use. And those templates are patterns that guide me to do things in a certain way and to actually avoid mistakes that might be very common in a particular project. A template is a pattern that shows us a model for how to do something. And I love that the word template comes from the same word temple. And a temple is a place where we go to experience God's patterns for life. He shows us how we can live and how we can align our lives to what he's expecting so we can find our way back in the presence of, of him. So when you go to the temple, when you think about the temple, think about what is God teaching me? What patterns is he revealing? How can I put my life into alignment with the template that he's putting there? Tyler's going to walk through these chapters with us and show how Nephi teaches us the gospel through patterns, through a temple pattern. In 2 Nephi 31, we are told by Nephi that uh, he's basically done. I'm finished, I can only write a few more things, and everything that I've written up through chapter 30, right before this, in our, our current version 30, he says, it sufficeth me, verse 2, save it be a few words which I must speak concerning the doctrine of Christ. You'll notice he says, I I'm done. I've, I've written everything that I need to write, except for I need to write a few more things concerning the doctrine of Christ. Now, if you pop down to verse 21, turn the page over, you'll notice that halfway through that verse, he says he's basically given you the doctrine of Christ. Uh, about five lines from the bottom, he says, behold, this is the doctrine of Christ and the only and true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God. Amen. So if you connect these, it becomes this, this neat little uh, bookend technique that ancient writers used all the time when they were giving you definitions or clarifying something. So a lot of people are familiar with the word chiasmus because Jack Welch made that famous about 50 years ago in the Book of Mormon, and it's that literary, ancient literary structure that is shaped like this. Um, because it's shaped like part of an X, which chi is the Greek letter for X, so it's chi asmus. Most are familiar with that. Here is another one of those kinds of ancient literary techniques that's all over the place in the Bible and in the ancient world, but you'll also find it all over the place in the Book of Mormon. They call it inclusio, which is the same meaning for inclusion, and what that technique is is if you're going to give a definition, make sure that you clearly demarcate where you're starting your definition and where you're ending it. Jesus is going to do this in 3 Nephi 27. Nephi does it here. You're going to find it, these, these inclusio bookends in all kinds of different places where they start things and end things. So if you want to know what the doctrine of Christ is, you'll look in here. Ironically, actually, in this particular case, Nephi is going to give you a little uh, sub extension to the closing in chapter 32 verse 6 where he says behold this is the doctrine of Christ so you get two closers and one opener so there you go now with that foundation let's dive in and look at the doctrine of Christ but Nephi tells you he's going to speak in plainness so he's he's going to just lay it out in plainness we're not going to cover all of the details he describes in chapter 31 why Jesus, the Lamb of God, would have to be baptized because he was holy. He gives you that description and you can look for all of the reasons that he gives down through verse 10. Now, something fascinating happens in verse 11. And the Father said, repent ye, repent ye, and be baptized in the name of my beloved Son. That's interesting because Nephi's sitting here writing, and all of a sudden he says, oh, and the Father said, so does that mean he's quoting the Father from some scriptural source? Look at verse 12, and also the voice of the Son came unto me, saying, he that is baptized in my name, to him will the Father give the Holy Ghost. The 
opening part of the doctrine of Christ is Nephi getting words from both the Father and the Son. If that's all we got, we would say, okay, I think he's listening to both the Father and the Son speak to him, but look at what happens as you turn the page over. Look at verse 14. But behold, my beloved brethren, thus came the voice of the Son unto me, saying, so now he's going to hear the voice of the Son again, and then verse 15, and I heard a voice from the Father saying, yea, the words of my beloved are true and faithful. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Brothers and sisters, Nephi has spent his whole life, here he is towards the end of his life, he's old, he knows he's done writing after these, these concepts are finished, and he's been listening to the voice of the Spirit his whole life, and now here towards the end he's being able to distinguish the voice of the Son speaking to him and the voice of the Father and recording those. Oh, and by the way, the voice of the Father in scriptures, if you look at all of the times when we know for sure that it's the Father speaking, and especially when he's introducing the Son, there's one word that is more commonly repeated in all of those scriptures than any other that I can find, and that word is beloved. He's a God of love, and he, as he introduces his son, he introduces him in every case as the beloved son. We know that Jesus is fully aware of the fact that Heavenly Father loves him, but how do you think it makes even him feel when he hears the Father repeatedly tell people how much he loves this son of his? If we want to be more like the Lord, we might want to spend more time verbalizing that love for others. That's just a little side note. Let's play a really quick game of Pictionary. I'm going to draw something on the board. I can't play because I know what the answer is, right? Okay, yeah, you can't give any, any cheat here. A window. Any guesses yet? Might help if we do that. Okay, what we have here is the ancient tabernacle. This is an insight that I first uh, heard shared in an in-service many, many years ago up at the Logan Institute by Brother Schenk, and I've loved this ever since and, and thought through it, and, and it's just a gift that just keeps on giving. Nephi is going to teach us the doctrine of Christ, but he's coming out of a context of Jerusalem with Solomon's temple up on Mount Moriah, and Solomon's temple is built after the manner of the tabernacle in ancient Israel with Moses. So watch what happens as Taylor was saying there, the word temple is a template, there's a pattern, and you fit all these symbols into this pattern. The gospel of Jesus Christ fits all together. Its teachings aren't different than its practices if you figure out how they're, they're all coming together, and symbolically they find beautiful manifestations. So watch what happens. Here, just really quickly, orientation-wise, the outer courtyard is a nice symbol for the telestial kingdom. The inner uh, court, which in the temple is different than the tabernacle because this is a tent. This part right here is an enclosed tent. This is called the holy place. This is called the holy of holies. So this is a nice symbol representation for a terrestrial kingdom, and here is the presence of God with the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. And so you get this progression in the gospel of Jesus Christ that is taking you from the world in through progressively ascending and increasing capacities until you can walk back into the presence of the Father. That's the whole point of a temple experience. The temple, the template, is how to become like God and how to come into his presence. Look now at chapter uh, 31, verse 13. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, I know that if ye shall follow the Son with full purpose of heart, acting no hypocrisy and no deception before God, but with real intent, repenting of your sins, witnessing unto the Father that you're willing to take upon you the name of Christ by baptism, by following your Lord and your Savior down into the water, then ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. Then cometh the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost, and then can ye speak with the tongue of angels. As you look at this, anytime you get into symbolism, 
again, it's layered. And, and this isn't intended to close your mind off to only one interpretation and nothing else is valid. It's to say, this is one angle to look at the doctrine of Christ. There are many other wonderful and valid angles as well. So we're just going to work with this one for a minute. The altar of sacrifice is a beautiful symbol in many respects of what it means to really repent, to sacrifice something and consume it on this altar. The laver, I get it that it's not a, a in the tabernacle context, it's not a baptismal font, but it's a place where the priests could wash and become clean in order to enter into the holy place and perform their priestly functions. Now, you're noticing that uh, repentance and baptism then cometh the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, the light of the seven candles on the menorah, the candelabra, is in many respects a nice analogy to the lamp unto our feet, the Holy Ghost being this light that is given to us. So we can now enter the tent and get that uh, the gift of the Holy Ghost as we've worked through this process. You're noticing that we're missing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in the first principles and ordinances. I would say there's a nice symbol for that right here. Faith in Christ is what brings us to the altar to repent. Notice, we have faith in Christ, we don't check it at the door, we bring it from that outer gate, we repent, we get baptized, then we get the gift of the Holy Ghost. Notice this, go to verse 17. Wherefore, do the things which I have told you that I have seen that your Lord and your Redeemer should do. For this cause have they been shown unto me that you might know the gate by which you should enter. For the gate by which you should enter is repentance and baptism by water. Then cometh the remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. Often, I think we put so much emphasis on the cleansing nature of water that we get this idea that we are baptized and now we're fully cleansed and we're fully forgiven. Nephi seems to be telling us here that after we've repented and gotten baptized, then cometh the remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. It's the two-stage cleansing process and you need both of them in order to be completely uh, forgiven. Now notice verse 18. Then are ye in this straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life. Brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but in the English I learned as a kid growing up, I would have never in a million years used the preposition in when referring to a path if I'm on my way somewhere. I would never say uh, I'm in the path to the Y up on the mountain here in Provo. I'm in the path. I would never say that. I would say I'm on the path. So makes you wonder if, if there's a mistake here, right? Notice verse 19, and now, my beloved brethren, after you've gotten into this straight and narrow path. Hmm. So it looks like it wasn't a mistake. It looks like Nephi's serious about this word, that it's in and into a path, not on and onto the path. Now, the only way that in my mind I can reconcile that is if the path is symbolized by something that is actually inside something. The gate by which you enter into the path, then are ye in the path. Brothers and sisters, the holy place is the straight and narrow path in this symbolic interpretation. When you get baptized, you are entering into a covenant with God and you're entering into the kingdom of God on the earth. This room right here, it's totally enclosed in the tabernacle. You are in the straight and narrow way. You're in this path and when you get baptized today, you enter into the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the kingdom of God on the earth. This holy place is a nice symbol for the church itself. So people who say, no, I can go and connect with God better in nature than going and gathering with the saints, it's this idea of there is something that takes place in the holy place that is the covenant path. It's the straight and narrow path and I have to gather here in order to really keep progressing. Here's the problem for some. They, they have faith, they repent, they get baptized, they get the gift of the Holy Ghost, they come up to the veil 
this curtain, this veil, is covered with angels. It's here at the altar of incense where they pray, they knock. You knock on at the veil to try to get in to the presence of God. You make your requests, the smoke is ascending off of that, that altar of incense in front of the veil, symbolic of all of the prayers and the desires and the, and the heartfelt goals of these people ascending in front of the presence of God just on the other side of that curtain. Now, you've said your prayers, you're pleading, you're knocking, you come over to the table of showbread, and it's there where you have 12 loaves of unleavened bread. Rabbinical tradition says that there's also a pitcher of wine there, and this gets replaced every week. You feast on the words. You, you read your scriptures. You read your patriarchal blessing. You listen to general conference. You feast on the words of the Lord wherever they can be brought into your life. Then you walk by the light of the Spirit, seeking his guidance. You pray. You read your scriptures some more. You go to church and you keep going. And after a while, some members of the church feel like they're just going in circles, and they feel like, why do I have to have another lesson on this topic? Why do I need to go to the temple again? I don't get anything out of it, some people will say. What happens if you take your camera angle from here and go down to here and watch what's happening? People come, they repent with faith, they get baptized, they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, they enter into the holy place, the straight and narrow path, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they then begin this process, and yes, they are indeed going in circles. They're definitely going in circles, but the point, brothers and sisters, is you're having another lesson on faith, or you're having another lesson on charity, or you're having another lesson on temple work. For the hundredth time, you're having a lesson, but you're having that lesson now from a higher level, a higher perspective, more life experience, more trials and tribulations you've passed through and learned from, more mistakes you've made and grown through, and you can understand them and participate at a different level than you could the first few times you had those kinds of lessons, and you can help encourage others to stay on the covenant path. Look at verse 20, wherefore ye must press forward with a steadfast faith in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the words of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life, and this is the way. Now notice as you shift over into verse 30, or into chapter 32, he says, Now behold, my beloved brethren, I suppose that ye ponder somewhat in your hearts concerning that which ye should do after ye have entered in by the way. But behold, why do you ponder these things in your hearts? Just because you're in the church, you've done all these things, now you're in the church, and now you're like, okay, now what do I do? Do you not remember that I said unto you after you'd received the Holy Ghost, you could speak with the tongue of angels? How could you speak with the tongue of angels save it were by the Holy Ghost? When you are in the holy place, the Holy Ghost is slowly teaching you the tongue of angels. You're learning to communicate in a tongue that you weren't born with, you're not native. The tongue of angels, there are angels all over the veil separating and guarding the way into the presence of God. And so he tells you in verse 3, angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, wherefore they speak the words of Christ. Wherefore I said unto you, feast upon the words of Christ. Now, notice this, verse 6, behold, this is the doctrine of Christ, and there will be no more doctrine given until after he shall manifest himself unto you in the flesh. If he's manifesting himself unto you in the flesh, you're now in his presence. You've made it through the holy of holy or through the veil into the holy of holies. You're now in His presence. Nephi's been talking about all these other things. Now we finally get into the presence of God. Watch this: there will be no more doctrine given until after He shall manifest Himself unto you in the flesh. And when He shall manifest Himself unto you in the flesh, the things which He shall say unto you shall ye observe to do. Now here we go. He's going to describe this holy of holies experience. Verse seven. And now I, Nephi, cannot say more. The Spirit stoppeth mine utterance. 
and I am left to mourn because of the unbelief and the wickedness and the ignorance and the stiff-neckedness of men, for they will not search knowledge nor understand great knowledge when it is given unto them in plainness, even as plain as word can be. Nephi was apparently ready to tell us some things about what it's like to be in the presence of the Lord. We know he has been. Back in first, or Second Nephi 11, he tells you this, and, and you see the great vision from First Nephi. And he was probably ready to share some things, and the Spirit stopped him. No, Nephi, don't write that. So Nephi's left mourning saying, oh no, I, I was kind of building up and wanting to share this, now I can't. So what is his conclusion? Verse 8, I perceive that you ponder still in your hearts, and it grieveth me that I must speak concerning this thing. For if you would hearken unto the Spirit which teaches the man to pray, you would know that you must pray, for the evil spirit teaches not a man to pray. And so then he tells us to pray always. You just keep praying and praying and praying and pleading your way through this process until that day comes for you that the, uh, that the veil opens up. This is a beautiful pattern. We hope that as you look at what Tyler's laid out here on the board, you can see Nephi's words afresh and that you can see the temple experience and you can see where you're at on this path. And I love what we've read here in verse 18 of 2 Nephi 31. Then are ye in this straight and narrow. And it reminds me of Nephi and Lehi both seeing the tree of life. There's a straight and narrow path that leads to the tree where you fully partake of the fruit of the atonement. And this is that straight and narrow path. The temple is the template or the pattern. And so as you read the scriptures, you can see these patterns happening throughout scriptures. And this just reveals in plainness what Nephi was trying to convince us of. Now, one other thing to add to this little uh, overlay or this template, so to speak, is a realization of what it means to live, I'll just redraw those, what it means to live in the dispensation of the fullness of times. In Jesus' day, in Nephi's day, in Moses' day, there are very clearly delineated and, and marked off boundaries. If In the time of Jesus, if you're a Gentile in, uh, in Herod's temple, there is a, a fenced latticework uh, soreg that you are not allowed to pass if you're a Gentile. That's as close as you can come to the presence of God if you're a Gentile in Jesus' day. If you're a woman, you can come into the court of the women. That's as far as you can go in Jesus' day. If you're a man, you can come into the court of the men, which is just a little bit further. If you're a priest, you can come into the court of the priest, and if you're assigned to do one of the functions inside of the holy place, you can go in and do that. But only one person gets to go into the Holy of Holies one time a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Now today, everyone, all are alike unto God black, white, bond, free, male, female, Jew, Gentile, all of these, Jesus has broken down all of these boundaries. The veil has been ripped open from top to bottom, which means heaven ripped the veil. Mankind did not. Heaven opened wide the gate and made open the path, but there's only one path. There's no back door in. There's one path to come in, and it is a straight and narrow way that brings us into him. All of these Gentiles, these women, these men, these priests, everybody is welcome to come into the celestial room of the temple today. And that is what we're walking through in a beautiful template way at one level when we go and do an endowment session in the temple of our God today as we're learning how to walk back into the presence of Father. Oh my gosh, this is so awesome, so exciting. This is why I love the scriptures, I love the gospel, I love Revelation. It's just so exciting to see that God has a plan and it's just everywhere. And sometimes we just need to peel up a bit of the layers of our fallen world to see the patterns that God has revealed. So this is really exciting, Tyler. It's really fun to see this. Okay, last chapter and then we have to say farewell to Nephi. Look at verse one, chapter 33. Now I, Nephi, cannot write all the things which were taught among my people neither am I mighty in writing like unto speaking." Now, how many times have you read the books of First and Second Nephi and thought to yourself, oh, this is so painful. Nephi is such a, a bad writer. I wish I could listen to him speak because 
his words are kind of, kind of weak. How many times have you had that experience? If you're like me, you're saying, man, this guy is phenomenal with words. But look what he says here. When a man speaketh by the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost carrieth it unto the hearts of the children of men. Just like back when we were talking about the path, on versus in, another funny preposition here. If a man or a woman is speaking by the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost carrieth it unto the heart of the children of men. He says if you are doing your job as a speaker, the power of the Holy Ghost is going to carry it unto the hearts of your listeners. Um, the word we would have probably preferred that he used there would be into. And this is a fascinating little uh, word play going on in English. It, it doesn't work in other languages. But what's the only difference between those? You'll notice that it comes down to you and I. Let's play this out a little bit further. If you do your job as my teacher and I'm sitting in your gospel doctrine class or in a sacrament meeting where you're speaking, if you've done your job and you have prepared by the power of the Holy Ghost, you've, you've prepared your heart, your mind, you come and you present, he says, when a man speaketh by the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost carrieth it unto. You did your job. I have to do my job as a learner to let it in. Now, what do you notice? Look at the word heart. It begins with here. You actually have an ear in your heart, and it happens to be in the middle of your heart, not on the wings, which means your heart has to be softened, it has to be opened in order for that ear to hear. And by the way, it is he to whom you really listen, not us, not, not the people at the pulpit, not the, the people sitting in the couches around you. You listen to the, to the voice of the Spirit, and it is somewhat of an art form. It'll get easier, like a language that is foreign to you at first, an art form that gets easier over time the more you soften and ask God to soften and open your heart, then you can actually get to the point where even if the speaker is awful and has not prepared, you can still have the Holy Ghost come and teach you because the most important truths that you're going to ever learn in life aren't going to bounce off of your eardrums. They're going to be truths that are felt deep in your heart. That's where lives change, is down in this level, not at the eardrum level and at the retina level of the eyes. People don't change because of things they see and hear. They make lasting changes because of things they feel. And I think Nephi is lamenting the fact that he can't force this message in, but if he could speak to us, we would at least have the message carried unto, but at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, it's our job to open up these scriptures and not just open the scriptures, but open our heart because we've opened the scriptures and let that message distill on our, on our souls. We're going to invite you now to spend time with those that you love looking and pondering and searching the scriptures and listening to Nephi's final testimony. Puts it right here in verse 10, if you shall believe in Christ, you will believe in these words, for they are the words of Christ, and he hath given them unto you, and they teach all men that they should do good. And after all the things that Nephi has written, that's what he wants us to focus on. Tyler and I have spent a lot of time studying and teaching scriptures. There's a lot of amazing things to talk about, but what really matters is Jesus. You know, can we talk about the transmission history of scriptures, the translation process, symbolism, on and on and on. I mean, I spent years in graduate school. In fact, one of the graduate schools I was in had 500,000 books just on scripture, okay? That's a lot of books. In fact, I once did a, I figured out it would take me years just to read the titles, not even the books themselves. Nephi's just being really focused. Like, look, it's all about Jesus. Don't get distracted. Stay on the straight and narrow and believe in Christ. And if you do those things, you will have the joy and the prosperity that he has promised. So let me finish with, with uh, one other quick concept here. The very, very last testimony from Nephi, he says, uh, for what I seal on earth shall be brought against you at the judgment bar, for thus hath the Lord commanded me, and I must obey. Amen. If you can think of one phrase that would be the most appropriate way for Nephi to sign off, 
what word would you expect him to use in there? I think most of us would think obey is a pretty good last word besides the word amen. That defines Nephi. I must obey. So, as you uh, embark on this study and you, you keep in mind that all the doctrines you're learning tie into the same template as what we've talked about with the temple and this journey that we're making back to the presence of God, and we do it symbolically every time we go to the temple. I just need to share one quick experience with you from the temple. Years ago, my wife and I were sitting in the Bountiful Utah Temple in the ceiling room that we actually had been sealed in a few years before, and uh, her sister, Tamara, was getting married to our soon-to-be brother-in-law, Greg, and they walked in and their sealer walked in in front of them and stood on one side of the altar while they sat on the sofa. And the sealer was right in front of me and my wife where we were sitting, and he said to us, uh, my wife and I, I don't remember all the details because I wasn't paying that close attention at that point. He said something like, my wife and I just returned from the Holy Land. And he, I think he talked about some things that they had seen in Galilee and down in Jerusalem and how significant that was for him. But then he said this part, and I'll never forget this, he said, it is a holy thing to walk where Jesus walked, but it is a holier thing to walk where Jesus walks. Welcome to the temple, brothers and sisters. He had my attention. Sometimes we wait to experience joy and to experience uh, light and, and heavenly things for the next life. Brothers and sisters, we'd invite you to experience the plan of happiness today as you dive into the book at deeper levels than you've ever done before. Tread on those pages and walk where Jesus walks by visiting the temple and keep, keep this process moving and growing. And yeah, it might feel like you're going in circles, but if you're doing it right, those circles are taking you to a pretty, pretty sacred space.